church? I'll be reading the uh, word of God from Mark chapter 10, verse 32 to 45. I'm reading from, from the NIV. Mm. Jesus predicts his death a third time. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lebo. Um, good morning, church. And thank you to the worship team for doing such a stellar, stellar, stellar job. If, if you were in my family, in my house this past week, you would have heard the last song that we sang. You are worthy of it all, all the time, to the extent that my kids were saying, are you going to be humming that song all, all the time? <laughs> so, and I didn't speak to Jake and tell him uh, to, or request that uh, he play that song, or they sing that song. It was just against the Holy Spirit. Nice. Amen. Uh, greetings, family. My name is Shia, my last name Lehong, and I've got the privilege of preaching today, and I am um, part of the preaching team in this family. I know that there are most people who have never seen me before, or who have not spoken to me, or heard me speak most likely. But yeah, that is who I am. Uh, I am a husband to one wife, <laughs> and a father to two boys. And if you do hear me referring to my girlfriend, if it does happen, not that it's going to happen, but if it does happen, just know that I'm referring to my wife, because I married my girlfriend, if you know what I mean. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, where do we start? I greet you again in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Um, let me ask these two questions uh, as before we go on into the thick of things, as they say. Have you ever felt misunderstood? You know, you say one thing to someone, but they hear something else. I see you looking at your wife. <laughs> you know, you say one thing, they hear another thing. No matter how hard you try to explain what you are saying, they just don't get it. You know? Have you ever been in that position? And secondly, if you've got the privilege of working, why do you work? Is money the sole motivator for you working? Are you working for month end? Or are you working because there is a bigger purpose that you are working for, that you need to achieve? These are the things that I hope that we will grapple with as we proceed in this particular scripture for this particular morning. Allow me before, before we continue to posture us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Lord God, you are worthy of it all. We stand before you, O oh Father God, as vessels awaiting to be utilized by you, O oh Father God. 
Not our will be done, but yours, O Lord, of all creation. Father, I pray as you're going to be delving into your word, O Father God, that may it not be me that speaks, O Father God. I pray that may you use my vocal cords, use my, my mouth, O Father God, to be able to speak to your children, O Father God. I pray, O Father God, that may you speak to their hearts and say things that you want them to hear, O Father God, even though I do not mention them at all, O Father God. For this is about you, O Lord of all creation. For you are worthy of it all, O Father God. We, we come to you, O Father God, saying we are here. Use us as a wine press, O Father God. Create a new wine out of us, O Father God, that others may drink from, O Father. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, so I had planned that I'm going to be using a tablet, and it decided that, nah, not today, champ. And then I was like, okay. So there are three, three aspects that we're going to be looking at this morning. The first thing is, if you are one of those that take notes and, you know, you want pointers so that you can be able to follow uh, clearly. The first one I think they will be mentioned here is, he knew what awaited him. Who knew what awaited him? Christ knew what awaited him. And then we will look at how the disciples, or some of the disciples, responded. But holistically, how they responded to what he had mentioned to them, what he had told them. And we will see that there's a way that they responded that we ought not to respond to their directives or to communication from Christ. And now the other question would, that would come to mind is, okay, we would have had all of that. What now? What now? Let's start with he knew what awaited him. If you go to the book of Mark, 32, Mark, Mark 10, verse 32, it says, They were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, and while those who followed him were afraid, again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen. Jesus was leading the way to Jerusalem. He was working with purpose despite knowing what awaited him where he was going. He led the way, and the disciples followed. They followed because they had a view of who Jesus was to them at that particular point in time. Whether their view of him was misunderstood is neither here nor there at this particular point in time. But the point is, they followed him, and he led the way. They had walked with him, and they had seen him perform miracles. They had seen him feed multitudes, heal the sick, open the eyes of the blind. They saw him heal broken hearts and love those who were outcast, who were shunned. They saw him love. They saw him portray true love. They saw him heal. They saw him forgive sins and raise the dead. They saw him cast out demons and calm the sea. They saw him do all these things, and they figured this is a person worth following. And they followed him. They followed his lead. The question that comes to one's mind is, who has taken the lead in your life? Who has taken the lead in your family's life? Who is your family following? Who are you following? Are there aspects of your life that you are still holding on to and not willing to let him take the lead? Is Jesus leading your relationships, your friendships, even your marriage? Is he the one that is leading? Is he the one that's showing you the way? Or are you just winging it, knowing or thinking that you know exactly what to do? Are you holding on to the things that he should take the lead Ever thought that the author and finisher of our faith, he who was and is and is to come, might be the actual right person to take the lead of your life, of the situations in your life, of the struggles that you are facing? Have you ever thought of letting go and relinquishing control over to him? That's so he can lead you. Because he will never lead you astray. He will never lead you to problematic situations. He will always lead you to life. 
See, the disciples were astonished, and while those who followed him were afraid. And why were those who followed him afraid, though, one may ask? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Well, the Bible tells us where Jesus was and his disciples were going. They were going to Jerusalem. And the significance of telling us this particular aspect is the season in which they were in. They were just approaching the Passover, just like we are approaching the Passover. The disciples and everyone that followed Jesus knew that he was a wanted man. The Pharisees had uh, issued an order and made it known that he was wanted. This explains why those that followed him were afraid. He knew he was wanted. They knew he was wanted. Those that followed him knew that he was indeed wanted. And I'm not making this up, I'm telling you, family. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 11, verse 55, to verse 57. The Bible says, and this was after he had risen um, or rose Lazarus from the death. The Bible says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up uh, from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and they stood there, they stood in the temple courts. They asked one another, what do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priest and the Pharisees had, had made orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. So imagine working with someone that you know is a fugitive. And you know the kind of authority that these Pharisees and the chief priests are holding. Definitely you would also be afraid of the person that you are working with. When you know that he's a wanted man. He knew he was a wanted man. But he still went anyways. You see, the distance between Bethany and Jerusalem is about 3.2 kilometers. Remember that Bethany is where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And act the high priest and the Pharisees. Jesus was not oblivious to what was going to happen when he got there. This also explains why those who, that followed him were afraid. But they do not let their fear dissuade them from following him. What about you? Is there anything that is holding you back from following him? Is there any fear that is holding you back from following him? The fear of your own insignificance to some extent. The fear of but I have sinned. I'm not worthy. Well, you may not necessarily be worthy, but he is worthy of it all. He is worthy of it all. He is worthy of it all. Let not fear hold you back from following him. Let not your own uh, viewpoint of yourself hold you back from following him. Let him take the lead. Let him be the one that follows now the Bible continues to say that again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen. He told them what was going to happen. What are we, we are going to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit, him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will arise. Now remember, this is the third time that Jesus is talking about his impending death. He has spoken about it in chapter 8 when Peter came out and said, I'm rebuking you, you're not going to do that. And then he said to Peter, get thee away from me, Satan. And then in verse 9, he said the same thing. And immediately what happened? the disciples started talking who was the greatest among them. There's a pattern here. I'm not sure if you're seeing it. Every time he tells them something and wants them to understand something, they come forth or they are hearing something else. Is Jesus Christ saying something to you and you're hearing something else? Is there a viewpoint of who he is that you're holding which is not true, but still you're holding on to it? Because you have convinced yourself that is the correct one. Everything he said took place. 
Judas delivered Jesus Christ to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They condemned him worthy of death, spat on him, punched him. You can go look at Mark 14 for that. Took him to Pilate. He was mocked by the soldiers and eventually crucified. He knew all this was going to happen before he entered Jerusalem. But he went anyways. He knew what was going to happen to him. He knew the ridicule that he was going to undergo. But he went anyway. The purpose was far too great for him not to go. The plight of humanity depended on him going to Jerusalem. This also begs the question, is there any decision in your life that you've ever made that you knew that those around you would not understand or believe what exactly was going on? Or even agree with it, but you made it anyways. It did not make sense to those outside of you, but you felt the nudging of the Lord to make the decision, taking the leap of faith, the decision to stand up for truth, for justice, for honesty, for equality, in spite of your personal cost. Loving someone that the community does not accept. Welcoming someone into your home and the people around you shun you for doing so. They turn their backs on you, yet the peace of the Lord reigns supreme in your life. Choosing to adopt a child of a different race, marrying someone from a different race, and your friends that you grew up with saying, I, we don't recognize you anymore. But you know. You know that you know. Jesus went anyways. Despite all the shame that he was going to suffer. Are there decisions that you're not making simply because you're afraid of being judged? Are there people you're walking away from because those around you don't agree for you to be with them, yet you know that Christ has told you this is the person that I want you to create a relationship, form a family, a bond with? Simply because somebody else says, I, I don't agree with your decision, and then you walk away. Imagine if Christ walked away and said, no, I'm not going to the cross. You do all this because you know it's worth it. Jesus led the way to Jerusalem knowing exactly what was awaiting him. He did it knowing that reconciling us to the Father was worth it. He did it knowing that you and I are worth it. That you and I are worth it. You see, Christ knows exactly what is going on or what, what we are going through. He even knows the intentions behind the ways that we speak and how we act. He also knows that some among us are in a conditional relationship with him. That our faith is hanging on a thread. We say, Lord, I will serve you. I will serve you as long as you look after me. As long as you bless me. As long as you give me a job. As long as you keep me from any incurable disease. I will serve you wholeheartedly. Jesus went to Jerusalem knowing that his disciples would deny him, knowing that they would all walk away from him. But he went anyways, knowing that the people that he is doing all this for are going to be the ones that ridicule him, the ones that crucify him. But he went anyway. You see, some of us are under the impression that if we go through tough times, it means that God has forsaken us. Forgetting that he said, I will never leave nor forsake you. He may be there and asking, but if he knows what is going on in my life, why does he not come? Why does he not intervene and fix my situation like that? Because I know he can. He did it with the, with the daughter of the, of the centurion. He just said it. Your faith has healed, has made her well. Go home. He can do that. Why does he not do it to my situation? Why is he not intervening now? Well, when he was told of Lazarus' illness, he could have just said the word and Lazarus would have been made well. But we all know what happened, don't we? 
If you don't, let's go to John 11. Read from verse 1 to verse 7. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters went to see, sent away to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. Imagine, they're not saying Lazarus is sick. They're saying the one you love is sick. And how much more of us that we know how much he loves us. The situation that we are going through, he knows about it. They told him, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Imagine he knows somebody else is going through the most, but he says, I know, but I still have other things to do. And it is not that those things are more important, but there is a reason for the glory of God. I don't know if it was on Tuesday morning, um, Tuesday, Tuesday evening around 10, 11 p.m. And I was busy preparing the sermon. And I had heard a story a long time ago about a preacher known as Duan Miller. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. Duan Miller was a preacher in the U.S. And he worked tirelessly for the Lord. He, he passed out a church and he was doing great things for, for the Lord. And one day he felt a bit sick. And then a week later, he couldn't speak. He went to the doctor. The doctor looked at him and said, now, you might be having a throat infection. And they gave him medication. And he thought that he would be well. Well, he was seen by over 200 doctors who could not diagnose the infection for over three years. A pastor whose work is preaching cannot now preach. A pastor whose work is speaking cannot now speak. He had to resign from the church and eventually he got a, bit, a, a job but then that job also fell through. He thought, okay, I always wanted to write a book. So he wrote manuscripts and sent to publishers. The publishers read it and said, no, these are very good books but you are not a known person. Therefore, your book would need you to go around on book tours. And we have to speak, but he cannot speak. And he tells a story that after three years, when he had lost almost everything, he was sitting on a Friday evening with a gun in his hand and he was ready to end it all because he felt neglected. He felt that the one whom he depended on, whom he worked for, had left him. He says his wife came in and saw him sitting on a chair with a gun. She didn't say anything, neither did he. The whole Saturday he says that he was that side, the wife was that side of the house. And the funny thing is for the Sunday he was called to come and preach. He knew that he wanted to, he couldn't do it, he didn't have it in him to go and preach. And he tried to find somebody else to stand for him, but nobody was available. And guess what he was preaching about? Healing. He had to stand in front of people speaking like, eh, and nobody could clearly hear him. The special mic had to be created for him and speak about his belief in the power of healing. That God did not stop healing in the Bible. And if you have time, Try Googling him or go to YouTube and, and, and you will hear him preaching. Duan Miller. He'd be pre he was talking about healing. And as, as he was speaking, and then he felt like there was a lump on his throat. Cleared it. And as he pre continued to preach, his voice was restored. On the pulpit. 
his voice was restored on the pulpit. It took three years. God could have just done it just like that. But everything happens for a reason, for his glory. Sometimes you may not understand it. You may want answers to happen right there and then. Sometimes you may have somebody that you love dearly that is sick and the doctors say, there's nothing else we can do. And sometimes those particular individuals pass on. But you know that your God is able to heal. You know that he's able to intervene. But he's a God who knows everything. I remember a couple of years ago, my family went through a tragedy. And as we came out of it, my wife came out singing and praising. We had lost a baby and, and she came out worshipping. And I couldn't understand it. And she told me a story that in the midst of everything, when she was under, she felt God speak to her. God comforted her. He comforted her. She came out after losing something that you had carried for six months in your, in your belly. And she came worshipping. And I was sitting there crying and not understanding. But obviously, my selfishness came through, just to be honest with you guys. Because I was praying and crying that, why her? Why God did you come and speak to her? What about me? Who comforts me? That was my response to God comforting my wife. And I remember on the Saturday I was coming from watching rugby and I was in the car still crying out, Lord, what about me? Why did you not speak to me? And I clearly heard him say, imagine what would have happened if I didn't speak to her, if I did not comfort her. And I know my wife. I know my wife. If something is bothering her, oh, trust you me. Oh, trust you me. But God consoled her. God confront, comforted her. And that he did, not just for her, but for me. That I can be able to be there for her when she has already been comforted and held on by the loving arms of our Father. He does what he does for whatever reasons he does. You see, God we, see, we serve a God who knows exactly what we are going through. And he's also able to empathize with us. Hebrews 4, verse 15, clearly stipulates that. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. When nothing made sense, he held on. When nothing makes sense to you, do you hold on until you let go of the faith? When nothing makes sense to you, what do you do? Christ held on. I'm reminded of David when the soldiers wanted to stone him because when they came back from a war, they found that their families were gone. And everybody wanted to, to stone him to death. And the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. What do you do when nothing makes sense? What do you do when nothing makes sense? Do you give up or do you find courage in the Lord? Now, how not to respond? I've already said, the first time Jesus talked about his, his death, Peter rebuked him. The second time he spoke about his death, the disciples started speaking about who was the greatest. Third time he speaks about his death, this is the response. Mark 10, 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do this thing for us. Whatever we ask, what do you want me to do? So the first thing that James and John do after hearing about Christ's impending death, is what? Seek for a position of authority. Isn't it weird that the first thing that came to James and John's mind upon hearing that Jesus would die was to secure their seats? I mean, the person you have grown to love and implicitly trust tells you that they are going to die. And the first thing that you do 
is of put me in your last will and testament. So that as soon as you go, then I know I'm sorted. We, however, have to interrogate the context of this a bit more. You see, the disciples were Jewish or were of Jewish descent. During Jesus' time, the Jews had always understood the Messiah as king based upon the promise given by God to their ancestors, David. To their ancestor, David. The Jews thought that the Messiah would lead them to overthrow the Roman government and rebuild their country. The Jewish nation would then be ruled over by justice forever. What the Jews anticipated the most was to rebuild their nation. They wanted self-governance, being completely free from political and military control of foreigners. Jesus had told them that he was going to be killed and raised again on the third day. James and John had seen Lazarus raised from uh, the... Uh, James and John had seen Lazarus raised from the dead four days after his death. It would be a thing of waiting for three more days upon Jesus' resurrection. They will resume their ministerial position. You see, the Jews understood and the disciples also understood that when Jesus was not talking about, I am going to be killed. But that is not what history says about who the Messiah is and what he's going to do. So them asking for those particular positions wouldn't necessarily make much of a difference because he's supposed to be a king and he will rule. So after three days he will rise again and he will fulfill what he had said, what the Jewish tradition has said about the Messiah. Then they will become ministers. Then they will become ministers. James and John's response to the revelation that Jesus will die was to try and secure positions of authority in Jesus' kingdom upon his resurrection. Their response was premised on the wrong understanding of, who, of Jesus' mission here on earth, that is political and military overthrowing of the Roman Empire. Jesus still responded to their request with empathy, realizing they had missed the mark they had misunderstood his mission, he said in verse 38. You do not know what you ask. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup? I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. We can, they said. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized but to sit at the right hand of my Father, to sit on the, at the right or on the left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to, for whom they have been prepared. We have seen a symbol of baptism this morning, but the one that he was talking about here was way different to the one that we have seen. Now we see a symbol of baptism that is full of grace, mercy, and love. The one he was talking about was way different. The one he was talking about was way different. Jesus referred them to the cup of ridicule and the process of being born anew and letting go of oneself and becoming completely new in Christ. Biblical scholars believe and say that James, the son of Zebedee, was either beheaded or stabbed with a sword by Herod Agrippa, around 44 AD, near Palestine, and not far from where he was, a local, he was on a local mission. His accusers, the person who accused uh, James, was converted by James' courage, and he was also beheaded with him. Imagine saying, yes, this one is the follower of Christ, and they come and say, renounce him deny Christ, and James said no. And the person who was accusing him sees James say no, and is willing to die for it, and comes forth and say, I also believe in what he believes. If he's willing to die, I'm also believing what he believes. That is enough for me. That is enough for me. It is not clear how John died, 
well, it is clear that they say that he died of natural death. Natural death, the only apostle, that is, that is John, who did not meet the Matthias' death. Banished by the Roman Empire, Emperor uh, Domitian to the Isle of Pat Patmos, where he penned the revelation. He was later freed and went to preach in Turkey and died at 100 years old. At 100, he was likely full of scars on his body because some say that there was a time that he was thrown into a cup, into a cauldron of boiling oil. As to how he survived, I do not know. I do not know. But here's another response that we see from the disciples. When they heard what James and John had requested, the rest of the twelve, that is the ten, were indignant. There is no reason to believe that the other disciples were angry because James and John as insensitivity uh, to Jesus' situation about his death. The twelve responded to the second passion prediction by arguing among themselves about who was greatest. Now they are offended because they are contending for the places of honor. James and John are trying to steal the prize from under their noses. We are currently approaching elections. Have you seen how many political parties are there? Who is going to be led and who is going to lead? Nobody wants to be led. Nobody wants to be led. Everybody wants to lead. Everybody wants to lead. May it not be so in the church that everybody wants to be seen to be doing something. May it not be so in the church that everybody wants to be in front of everybody else. May it not be so in the church that everyone wants the prestigious seat in the church. Jesus called them together. You know, that is verse 42. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high official exercises authority over them. Jesus did not rebuke James and John. He does not rebuke the twelve. Instead, he uses their behavior as a springboard to teaching. We can be sure that he has their full attention now. James and John must be embarrassed at the exposure of their raw ambition. The other disciples are indignant and will listen carefully to ensure that Jesus addresses their concerns. Instead, Jesus instructs them about the kingdom of God, its rules, how it works. Jesus goes, in verse 43, we learn that Jesus goes on and gives the blueprint of how things work in the kingdom of God. As it says, not so with you though, in verse 43. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be, the, must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. As usual, he turns our world upside down as he introduced the rules of the road for the kingdom of God. Kingdom rules are altogether different from the rules of this world. Just the opposite, in fact. Those who live by the rules of this world honor power, even though, power, even though powerful rulers are often selfish, petty, tyrant, who treats their subject badly. Where do we fall? Are we after positions of authority to be seen and served? Or are we the ones who serve even when no one is watching? We have someone in this, in this family that the likelihood is you might have been here for more than a two months or so, but I've never seen his face or heard him speak. His name is Rudolf. He's there at the back, on top. He's the one that makes it possible that those that stand here have a seamless work. 
He is a pillar that makes the functions seamless. You never see him. You never hear him. But he serves. But he serves. In the kingdom of God, honor will go to those who serve rather than those who exact service from others. First prize will go to the born servant of all, a slave, an inferior even to a servant. An absurd proposition, you would say. But fully keeping with Jesus' recent statement, if any man wants to be the first, he shall be last of all and be a servant of all. A slave typically only serves one master. In Luke 16, verse 13, Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. However, a slave will, at the bidding of the master, serve everyone in the house, and in doing so, he would be serving only one master. Christ calls us to serve all to become slaves to all. When we do so, we serve one master, Christ. Jesus calls us to a different ethic, telling us that God honors, that God honors service rather than power. He challenges us to begin living by the kingdom rules in the here and now. It is tough to serve those and a lesson that we must continuously relearn. Personal ambitions did not start with James and John, nor did they end with James and John. Verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus does not require more than he is willing to give. He modeled service and sacrifice from cradle to grave. He would never ask you more than he is willing to give. While in the form of God, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Earlier, Jesus, Jesus told his disciples that he must die. That is in, verse, in chapter 8, chapter 9, and 10. Now he tells them why he has to die. He gives them he will give his life as a ransom for many. As a ransom for you and I to be reconciled. Jesus modeled service and sacrifice for his disciples. But he accomplishes something that some disciples cannot, that the disciples cannot. Only Jesus can give, can serve as a ransom for many. Only he can. Jesus has a unique role in the plan of salvation. You have heard me speak now for a while. The question is what now? What now? Of all that we have heard, what is our response to it? What, how should we respond to it? Well, I'll say start serving. Be a servant to your spouse, to your children, to your friends, to your family. Serve those that are around you. Start shining the light and be the salt of the earth. Let those that come across you know that indeed Jesus Christ is alive by the mere interaction with you, by how you treat them, by how you serve them, by how you love them by how you are humble before them. When you serve, check your heart. Make sure that your heart is in the right place. Make sure that you're not saving so that you can be seen to be saving. 
And it is something that we always have to relearn. A couple of weeks ago, I had to buy my boy a bicycle after having promised him for quite a while. I got a good deal on a 16-inch bike, brought it home, and I was very excited that they would love it. And he looked at it and he said, I don't like the color. <laughs> it was purple. He says, I don't like the color. And later on, the mother sent me a message saying, you know exactly what you want. But when your children say that they don't want it, why is it that you don't give them what they want? It had me to self-introspect. I bought the bike and I thought he was going to be very excited because daddy got me what I wanted. It was all about me getting the appreciation. My heart was not in the right place in getting the bike for him, that particular one. Many of us have to continuously relearn in our service. It happens even now and then when I serve my wife that sometimes I get tired and I say, but when am I going to be served? I always have to recheck the heart. When you serve, it shouldn't be just for you to show that you're serving. It is imperative for you to make sure that your heart is in the right place, that you are serving with the right intentions, the right ambitions to serve, not to be seen to be served, not to be applauded that you are serving, but serve. Serve when you want to serve. If you do not know where to start to serve, even here we've got several ministries that you can serve in. I can only speak mostly about the one that I'm involved in, which is set up and break down. And I also have to honestly give applause to my brother Ivan, as well as Christian. There are three guys in the setup ministry. Every Sunday, they come in the morning, they set up the chairs, prepare for the kids' ministry, and set up everything. After church, the very same guys and some others would assist also in the breakdown. And what it requires is only just maybe 15 minutes of your time after service to help maybe in the breakdown. You can serve in the children's ministry. One Sunday in a month, you can go help teach or even just supervise play. One Sunday in a month, you can help in serving tea and coffee or even juice. We have also many places for you to serve in if you do not know where to start. But serve. You don't have to serve here. Like I said, serve in your household. Serve at your workplace. Serve the people around you. Give of your talents in submission to the example that Christ made for us. I would ask the worship team to come through as we are concluding. There is always a place for you to serve. And my prayer is that in this, with this message, your heart may be opened to service, that you may know how to respond to the call of Christ, that selfish ambitions may be taken away from you, and that you will serve God wholeheartedly with the right intentions, that you will serve those around you, with love and kindness, that you will not look at anyone and think they are below, below being served by you, or think you're more important to serve. Serve. Start serving. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we, we have heard your word, O oh Father God, and we, we respond by humbling ourselves to you, O oh Father God by saying we, we surrender all to you, O oh Father God, and not just in words, O oh Father God, but going forward in even our actions, O oh Father God, will be a sign of surrender to you, Lord. So I pray for each and every one in this particular place, O oh Father God, that, Lord, may you speak to their hearts, O oh Jesus Christ, that you may show them what you will them 
have to, O oh Father God. O oh Father God, that you may direct them, that you may speak to their hearts, you may speak to our hearts, Lord God. Let me not exclude myself. For here I am, broken as I am, O oh Father God, still I come to you. Availing myself, O oh Father God, and I pray that they may avail themselves also, Father God, for your purpose. O oh Lord of all creation, may it only be you, O oh Father God, that we serve, that we surrender to, Lord God. We give all that we are, O oh Father God, to you and for you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.